Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. Our custom is to go around and introduce ourselves. <coughs> and um, I'd like to make the suggestion again that we proceed uh, our name by saying, my name is, and then saying my name. Um, my name is Ray Dyer. My name is Peter. My name is George. My name is Howard Deport. My name is Nabu Yamaji. And my name is Mac Holm. My name is Jay. My name is Jack Busby. <coughs> my name is Tom Thurston. My name is Bill Giles. My name is Marvin Snow. My name is Robert. My name is Richard. My name is David. My name is Mike. My name is Mark. My name is Ari. My name is Clint. My name is Jerry Jones. My name is Larry Wish. My name is Peter. My name is Esther. My name is Lydia. My name is Tom. Uh, again, with those people who are here for the first or second time, raise your hands again. Uh, I'd like to remind people to welcome the uh, newcomers. We do have a, a socializing time after the uh, closing here. Uh, today is a uh, what we call a Dharma duo, which is two members of the Sangha uh, sharing about their spiritual path and how they come to attend the Gay Buddhist uh, Fellowship. Uh, the two are Harley Shapiro and David Lewis. Uh, David, David has been a practicing Buddhist for over 30 years. At the height of the AIDS epidemic, he ran a meditation group for people living with HIV at the Zen Hospice Project, and he managed several annual retreats at Esalen Institute. In 2008, he is, he's joined the Spirit Rock Meditation Center's dedicated practitioner program a two-year program of Buddhist study and practice. Harley Shapiro has been a student and teacher of cultural anthropology and photography in Berkeley and in San Francisco since 1966. He has traveled, worked, and lived in many parts of the world, including Latin America, the Caribbean, West Africa, India, and Asia. He has worked with several HIV AIDS community service organizations, both locally and internationally. <coughs> From the San Francisco Summer of Love to the present Gay Buddhist Fellowship and Sangha, Harley has had a clear, eclectic practice and path. So I'll turn it over to you guys. on the beach at 8 o'clock this morning. It was a beautiful way to start this day. So I hope that's where everybody else is. I'd like to um, start and end with a quote, if I may, if I have time. Um, my starting quote is from Song Kaba, a Tibetan teacher. The human body, at peace with itself, is more precious than the rarest gem. Cherish your body. It is yours this one time only. The human form is one with great difficulty. It is easy to lose. All worldly things are brief, like lightning in the sky. This life, you must know, is the tiny splash of a raindrop. A thing of beauty that disappears even as it comes into being. Therefore, set your goal. Make use of every day and night to achieve it.
I came to um, the Gay Buddhist Fellowship. Well, I, I visited every once in a while over the years. Um, I've lived in San Francisco for about 20 years, but I started coming regularly about a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago. And it was um, it was after the passing of my partner of 12 years. He um, died of a heart attack and, and died quite suddenly. He was here one day and not the next. And, and it was a, a, a real a traumatic loss for me. And um, I've been practicing for quite a number of years, as we'll talk about, but I really felt the need um, after my partner's death to have a sangha just to sit with. I just, I really wasn't craving human contact as much as, as the support of a group to sit with. I, I had my own sitting practice at home, but um, didn't have a regular sangha to sit with. And um, the reason I'm up here today is I really want to just come and thank you guys for being so supportive to me um, in a silent way. I know we um, uh, very often started out asking people to, to identify if they're new and, and telling people to greet newcomers. And um, I'm really grateful for the fact that nobody did in my case. <laughs> I really just needed my own space. And after the sitting, you may or may not have noticed, I would just scuttle out because I just wasn't quite ready for talking and being with people. Um, and it's this this song has been really wonderfully supporting for me in the last year. Um, and now I really uh, I do want to get to know some of you guys. So thank you for that, and I'm hoping to change my manner of being with the sangha. I've been practicing uh, Buddhism for about 35 years, which is. Um, and when I actually sat down and counted it, and about it just amazing to me. I started out with um, an interest as a teenager. Um, I was reading Alan Watts and Ram Dass, and you know, all the '60s were happening, and the Beatles were into Eastern religion, and that all um, really appealed to me. I, uh, in my high school years, I lived in England or in Wales, actually, and. I did my first retreat when I was 17 years old in Scotland. I hitchhiked from Wales to Scotland to a retreat center that had been set up by um, uh, Trungpa Rinpoche. It was one of his early uh, monasteries before he came to the United States and set up Naropa and all the things that he, that he did here. <coughs> so I've considered myself a Buddhist pretty much ever since then. Although I, until really the last couple of years, I didn't call myself a Buddhist regularly. Um, one of the reasons for that is um, I, I was pretty self-judgmental and I didn't think that I was practicing enough and I didn't think that I really deserved it um, to call myself a Buddhist. And in a sense that was true because my, my practice for about the first 30 years of my practice was... Um, pretty much a wisdom practice. It was all about thought and reflection. It was about reading books and, and coming to an understanding and getting interested in the cosmology and the metaphysics and, of, of Buddhism and, and all of that. Um, and I did go on retreats. I didn't have a strong daily practice, but I went on retreats. But it was pretty much a wisdom tradition, thought and reflection. For those early years, I studied mostly with Tibetans in the Shambhala tradition. But when I moved to San Francisco in 1987, I switched to Vipassana. Um, it just seemed to offer a different perspective and uh, more of a heart-based practice from my perspective. And plus, Spirit Rock is just sitting out there in Marin. It's a spectacularly beautiful place with wonderful teachers. So I started practicing Vipassana. And soon after I moved here in the late 80s, the AIDS epidemic hit in a big way. And um, 
My first partner was HIV positive, and he died in 1991. And um, I just threw myself into the epidemic, taking care of friends, taking care of strangers, volunteering for nonprofit organizations. Um, AIDS, you know, the 90s for me was really all about AIDS, the epidemic, and, and, and relating to that. Besides my partner, I lost an awful lot of my friends, an awful lot of the people that I first met when I moved to San Francisco. That was a terrible time. Um, for those of you that were here, I'm sure you probably agree with me. But it was also kind of a wonderful time in a strange way. Um, when I moved here, and, and having the AIDS epidemic happen so quickly afterwards, or not just <laughs> happening even as I moved here, um, I sensed a tremendous community spirit in the um, gay community in San Francisco. We were all taking care of each other, we were taking care of our friends, we were taking care of strangers. I would show up at somebody's house that I maybe didn't know very well to do my... <clears throat> four-hour stint or whatever, and I'd meet all of his friends. And then I'd meet all of their friends, and then the next week it was somebody else. I just sensed a great sense of community, and um, I was always meeting people, and I was usually meeting people in the context of caretaking, in the context of suffering, trying to alleviate somebody else's suffering. And it was a kind of beautiful way, in a strange manner, of being introduced to San Francisco. I don't sense that kind of community <clears throat> response so much now, and I um, kind of miss it. I wouldn't want the epidemic to come back in, in that sort of way, but I think sometimes tragedy and hardship and suffering makes people connect and come together um, in a way that doesn't happen when our lives are <clears throat> kind of rolling along comfortably. Besides taking care of my friends in the 90s, um, <clears throat> I really wanted to use my practice and, and, and make the Dharma available to people, in caretakers, people that were dying, people who were sick, people who were frightening, uh, frightened, in whatever way it might be helpful. Um, I made friends with Frank Ostaseski, who was <clears throat> founder of the Zen Hospice Project and ended up being on the board of directors of that organization. But the main things, two things that I did there were I started a, a sitting group, a meditation group for people living with life-threatening illnesses. We met once a week on a weekday. And that went on for um, a good part of the 90s. And then also with, um, with Frank and also with the, the, the great assistance of the Esalen Institute, we started doing a yearly um, retreat for people living with life-threatening illnesses at the, at the Esalen Institute. They donated everything. Nobody paid for anything. We, we had the big house and we had it to ourselves. It was wonderful. And we did a week-long meditation group uh, retreat very often with people that had never meditated before. Um, and that, that was very valuable. Um, and moving to me and um, and difficult too because a lot of people were coming to meditation and to dharma at what they perceived to be and what in reality often was at the end of their lives and were kind of scrambling to catch up so the, the AIDS epidemic was a very powerful experience for me and, and really supported me in my practice um, but nevertheless, that practice was still a wisdom practice, a thought and reflection practice. So, um, Putis and inhibitors came along, and my friends weren't dying quite as much, and the need wasn't there um, as much as it was during the 90s. And about that time, I met my second partner, Ruben. And it was really uh, kind of a wonderful relief for me to fall back into relationship and and throw myself into my relationship with this one person and be able to kind of put the epidemic on a shelf for a while. 
because it exacted a lot of um, <coughs> energy and a lot of loss in my life that in a lot of ways I hadn't, didn't really deal with at the time because it wasn't time. There's was always somebody else to take care of. So I kind of lost myself into this other relationship for 12 years. And then, as I said, Reuben died about a year and a half ago. And um, that was another terrible thing for me. You know, it was different than people that died, died during the AIDS epidemic because you usually saw it coming when somebody had, was, was ill. And, um, with Reuben, I didn't, and it was a trauma. And I was really in shock for uh, several weeks. And then I had um, this experience, when, which in Buddhism is called Samvega. I don't know if you're, you're acquainted with it. Um, Samvega is um, something that happens sometimes when, when, when people meditate, when a person meditates really intensively over a long period of time. And they suddenly have a real, the realization of no self, of, um, no self of impermanence, impermanence, of anika, nada. Those things that we understand intellectually when we read about it, and we think, oh, that's kind of interesting about it in Buddhism, but to experience it on a gut, a gut level, direct experience, uh, to say the least, knocks the wind out of you. In Zen, I guess it's called uh, rolling up the mat because a lot of people, or some people sometimes, when they have this some vega experience, roll up their mat and go home and just stop practicing. It tends to have one or two reactions. Either you stop practicing because it's just all too overwhelming. You see things exactly as they are and it's just overwhelming. Or you are motivated to practice even more. And in my case, it motivated me to practice even more. So for the last um, year, year and a half, my practice has been not so much about wisdom, not so much about thought and reflection, but about compassion. I think um, compassion is uh, not a bad English translation for uh, the Buddhist concept. Uh, because passion, the, the English word passion, comes from the Latin word for suffering. We don't usually think in our culture of passion as being about suffering, but that's the Latin root, and compassion is with suffering. So compassion is, um, you can think of it like empathy. It's understanding the suffering of others by experiencing your own suffering and being able to relate to that. So when Reuben died, it, uh, it broke my heart, and a broken heart is an open heart. And my heart opened in a way that um, I don't think it has since I was a small child. And my practice became all about compassion and being in touch with my own suffering and understanding and, and seeing the suffering of others. And this has been a real challenge for me because... Um, I'll tell the truth, but I you know, walk through the caster now, what I see is suffering. I see you know, a lot of suffering on, in the faces of people. And that's, um, that's not a negative thing for me. That's a wonderful thing, because I can really I relate to them. And I, I think I can understand and see people on a level that's um, somewhere below the, the, the mask that we put on uh, our faces to meet the world. So my practice has become compassion. I've done a lot of meta practice. In fact, um, when I was really grieving, meta is what kept me going. Concentration practice, it just um, gave me great comfort and gave me a place to put my mind when I didn't know where to put it. But also mindfulness practice. So I've really thrown myself in the last year into my Buddhist practice and it's become the center of my life. Not a relationship anymore, not a job anymore, not any of those things that I used to define myself by. <coughs> and I'm 
I'm trying not to define myself by my practice, but my practice is where I'm putting all my energy now. I'm trying to keep the precepts as best I can. I've never made an effort to really keep the precepts, all of them, all the time until recently. I sit twice a day for about 40 minutes a day. I get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and sit. It's a great time to sit if you've never tried it. I do some Dharma study every day. I've always got a book going. I meet with a teacher every couple of weeks. And this year I'm joining the, the dedicated practitioners program at Spur Rock. That's kind of a graduate school for Buddhism. And I'm really looking forward to that. That's going to be another another sangha for me to, to be a part of. But the real difference between my practice now and my practice before, the difference between a compassion practice and, and, a, and a wisdom practice, is that my self, sense of self is much less. It's not as strong. The, thing, the, the one thing that I kept through 30 years of practice was a strong sense of self. And uh, that's something that needs to go sooner or later if you take your Buddhist practice seriously. And, and that's kind of where I'm at now. So, um, that's my life in the Buddhist world, and that's what brought me here. And I'd like to end with a quote before I turn things over to Harley, but um, I'll be happy to entertain questions or feedback afterwards. Uh, this is from the Buddha, from the Bhattarkarada Sutta. Do not pursue the past. Do not lose yourself in the future. The past no longer is. The future is, has not yet to come. Looking deeply as life, at life as it is, in the very here and now, the practitioner dwells in stability and freedom. We must be diligent today. To wait till tomorrow is too late. Death comes unexpectedly. How can we bargain with it? The sage calls a person who knows how to dwell in mindfulness night and day. The one who knows the better way to live alone. Thank you. Use this, Harley? Yes, fine. Can't make it go. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Very uh, <coughs> honored to be here this this morning to join with you and to share my journey. Uh, this has been a very wonderful part of my life for the last couple of years. It's been a very comfortable, energizing, balancing, centering place, and uh, I do appreciate all of you. Uh, I guess I was asked to talk a little bit about how Buddhism has influenced my life and for me, uh, how that has expressed in my life actions uh, about what life is all about for me. Uh, I really, over the years, uh, my life hasn't been really in study and in book learning, but in a travel and experience. And this is sort of where I uh, learn so much about observing behavior, observing people, meeting people. And I see, uh, after so many years, that I realize that so much of what I have been doing in my life really fits into the Buddha and to the Dharma and the Sangha. And uh, sometimes I guess we don't know where we're going, but we're going and learning as we go. Um, I've had many different teachers, many different friends. It's, uh, it's pretty eclectic, I might say. Maybe a uh, jack of all trades, but a master of none. And uh, for me, that's okay. 
Uh, I've been going along so many different paths and learning and absorbing ideas and people's experiences and cultures. And for me, it works. Uh, not flitting from one to the other, but actually just learning and absorbing it and trying to integrate it into my life and into my uh, behavior. Um, so I've had an exploration of many teachings and many cultures, many ideas. I was struck there was uh, one time I saw this movie uh, about Gerda Jeff, uh, meetings of, of, with remarkable men, and it struck me as just how wonderful to just go through the world and meet incredible people and learn from them, and uh, those would be my teachers, and it could be spiritual teachers, it could be a rickshaw driver, it could be a bus driver, it could be your next door neighbor. Uh, and that served me well, I hope. Uh, travel always interested me, and I believe that the truest kind of travel is, off, is inward. It's also the voyage of discovery, it, not in seeing new landscapes, but seeing old <clears throat> landscapes in a new way. And that's sort of been my mantra. And travel is not just as transport, but as transformation. And I hope it's, uh, it's helped me. I started off as a kid, uh, born in, under a star in Hollywood, actually, in Los Angeles, and into a Jewish family. Uh, I call it the tribe of California. Our, uh, our people were directly to California in San Francisco and Los Angeles, which is a little different. Always had a very supportive family, a large extended family, uh, always uh, giving the idea that you have to follow your heart and do what you need to do. There was always an emphasis on learning, on studying, on reasoning, on arguing, you know, the saying that if there's uh, five Jews in a room, there'll be eight different opinions. And uh, we also, it was okay to argue with each other and also to argue with God when we were studying. Uh, my Judaism and my family, it was, again, an eclectic. We had experiences with different kinds. We would visit the Sephardic and the Syrian and the different uh, Jewish communities. Uh, my Judaism was always, did not, oh, did not ever include hell or sin. Uh, though it included ethics. And basically, for me, it came down to the uh, golden rule, uh, do unto others as you'd have them do unto to you, and the rest is commentary. And that's sort of what I got out of it. As well as this term called tikkun olam, which uh, means to heal the world. And we always were taught to be politically active, socially conscious, and to go out and do deeds. Uh, and that's how I sort of went. It's uh, also very auspicious, I guess, today is the last day of Passover, and it's also the Eastern Orthodox Easter. So it's an auspicious day, and again, Passover, again, is uh, the, the holiday of leaving the exodus from Egypt, leaving slavery, a uh, historical, maybe, account, but also the whole spiritual thing of leaving your things that uh, keep you enslaved, uh, your mental problems, your suffering, and to be freedom. So that's really nice to be here for today. I guess I've always been mindful. I've always been observing. I've always been interested and curious. Uh, I became a photographer and uh, cultural anthropology, so I was just interested in observing. So I guess that sort of relates to mindfulness. I remember my spiritual thing in the synagogue. I usually wasn't interested in a lot of the things that were going on, but I would sort of trip on the stained glass and meditate and sort of have my own consciousness. I think later when I went to a Jewish camp and they had the prayer services outside under the trees and uh, under the sky, and that sort of resonated with me with creation and the energy of the universe and the goodness. I did have a lot of pain and suffering as well. There are a lot of those arrows. Uh, my father died when I was young. I had a cousin who had leukemia who just suffered so, but had just such a gentle way and such an acceptance, it was quite a lesson. I had another cousin that was uh, died in a car accident suddenly. And I also had 
knowledge and memories of the Holocaust that my family taught me about, so I knew about the horrors in the world and what suffering could be. And actually, one of my very important lessons, I think, is when uh, I went to Israel at one point and met this cousin. And she was a survivor from Europe, and uh, she and a few of her sisters and cousins were the only survivors of the family. She was, because they were young girls and they were used as sex slaves, I guess, by the Germans. And that's the only way they were survived. And I talked with her, and I knew one of her sisters was very religious and became a fanatic uh, religiously. Another one was totally secular and bitter and hatred of the tradition. Another one was probably ready for a mental uh, home. And she was just wonderful and lovely and, and perky. And I'm just like, how could you still have that joy of life after all you've experienced losing your family and being through that humiliation? And she said, you know, I just had the choice. I could either be bitter or I could open my heart. I could be angry or I could open my heart. And, you know, it was quite shocking that it's quite simple, I think. For some people, maybe it isn't. But I thought, well, that's always resonated with me, all the traumas and horrible things with our AIDS epidemic and such, that, you know, we have a choice. We could be angry and bitter or we could open our heart, and that, that sort of uh, kept with me. Uh, the 60s, I was lucky, <coughs> so fortunate to come up. Uh, we had family here, so I knew San Francisco. I knew this is where I wanted to be. Uh, I came up to Berkeley right in the middle of the 60s at the time of the Cultural Revolution and the excitement. Uh, there was music, there was politics, there was sex, there was drugs. Um, there was also the anti-war movement. There was a lot of suffering and pain because of that. Uh, I guess the events shaped my personal and professional decisions at the time. But I was really so fortunate that I was here in the Bay Area during that time. Uh, introduced to spirituality uh, in all the things. There was always Native Americans that showed up at political rallies or at the campus. And there were the hippies and the flower children. There were academia. There was astrology. There was the Grateful Dead concerts, a different way to look at death and dying. Um, the Haight-Ashbury and Polk Street, uh, the Fillmore Auditorium and Rich Street. Uh, there is Winterland and the I-Beam and the Stud. And in some ways, that, I guess for me, it was some sort of spiritual path to explore and to meet people and to have these experiences. Uh, a lot of times coming home from the disco late at night, I turn on the radio and there would be Alan Watts giving his talks on the radio until like four or five in the morning and I would not really know what he was talking about but I was listening and uh, later it made sense. There was Ram Das that always would be showing up and giving talks and groups and he was always so accessible and always just a guy. He wasn't a saint, he was just a guy and I really loved that. There was Allen Ginsberg, uh, the craziest Buddhist I ever saw, you know, during some of the anti-war protests. He would be there, you know, in the middle of the police and the soldiers and the chanting and the angry. He'd sit there and he would be chanting and doing his meditation. And uh, uh, that was always influences. There was Shlomo Karlbach and Scoop Nisker, actually, who has been here as a, a Buddhist teacher. And in those days, he was the radio announcer on the local rock stations. And he always had this wisdom and this wit and this uh, understanding of the universe that he shared to us. He was a wonderful teacher during the 60s and 70s, as he is now as well. Uh, so I was really, really lucky. I was able to, I always went during college and all these things to hear people. I was so lucky to be able to see Martin Luther King and hear him speak and Cesar Chavez and... Uh, even Robert Kennedy was in, on uh, Castro Street, actually, Castro and Market, the Sunday before the Tuesday that he was uh, killed. So I've been really, really lucky. My, uh, I also would say that during the uh, political stuff, the anti-war thing, I always sort of, uh, uh, sort of hung around the peaceful parts of those demonstrations. It always resonated with me to be around <clears throat> the nonviolent people, the peaceful, the spiritual folks at, at, at rallies. 
and I didn't know why. I just, that's where I hung out. Uh, my practice in those days was hopefully being political, but also I didn't do meditation, but I would go to places. I'd go to the Zen Center and sit, but not join. I would go to Green Gulch. I'd go to Tassajara and, you know, try and meditate and get bopped by a feather, you know, like sit up straighter and... You know, I lived close to, there's a little grocery store that was right kitty corner from the Zen Center in the 70s and the 80s, and I just bought all my food there. It was fresh from Green Gulch, and so I guess all this was absorbing in some way. I was lucky to uh, have friends through Peace Corps and other things that, so I was able to meet, uh, meet uh, visit the Lama Foundation, the Ropa, the Hanuman Foundation, and things in Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona. And these were also eclectic spiritual places. It wasn't one thing, but I was just, I went for fun. I went to absorb it. I didn't take anything real, real serious, but it became part of me. My practice basically was riding my bicycle through Golden Gate Park, swimming, doing yoga, meditating, and disco dancing. And uh, now a few of those have left, but those were basically my thing that kept me through a lot of this was breath and consciousness, and I found that in these different things. Also, I found a lot of the anger that was going on, and later in the AIDS epidemic, and with uh, all the political stuff we go through, that uh, to try to turn that into peaceful things, and to meditate. And just a wonderful thing during People's Park, when Ronald Reagan had called out the National Guard, and we were in curfew, and Berkeley and, you know, the, the people putting these flowers and the, the guns of the National Guard is something I always remember. Well, the 70s, uh, I was really lucky. I, I chose uh, a profession. I was a business major once, and then I just decided I wanted to do stuff that was more socially meaningful. And I switched to social sciences and anthropology, and somehow I just fell into doing graduate work and then teaching. And it enabled me to, I hope, to share multiculturalism and toleration to lots of students, as well as, for me, it gave me an opportunity for more travel to study abroad. I was really lucky to get uh, some uh, Fulbright scholarships, one to India, one to Korea, one to um, Argentina and Ecuador. So it was really, really fortunate. During the 70s, the Castro neighborhood started. I moved to the Castro right in 73 and met Harvey Milk. And being a photographer, I was so lucky that uh, this was a mix of gay politics, gay history, and my f photography. And I would be there every other day just because I had a lot of film that I was working with. But I'd sit up on the barber chair and just watch what was going on and learn and got to know the people through there. Uh, it was quite a wonderful time. Um, I was also lucky in the 70s that I was able to go to West Africa and also uh, live in Jamaica for a while and again learn how people with such poverty and no money and difficulties could have so much joy in their lives. And uh, you know, living in Jamaica with no electricity, no food, the only thing we could do is spear fish for fish and maybe get some rice and pick mangoes from the trees, but such joy and beauty, it really um, gave me some perspective. Um, I'd say that in 1977, Harvey Milk was elected supervisor. It was a very exciting time for the city and for all of us. And after a long, it was just a wonderful time. Right at that time, I got picked to be uh, Fulbright uh, to India out of the blue. I never thought I'd be going to India, even though I travel. But, and before I knew it, I was whisked off with some other uh, uh, professors from the uh, University of San Francisco. My uh, mentor was an Indian professor and his Filipino wife, and they were the, the group leaders, and they were going to go to his home and have a Filipino Indian wedding in Pune, so that was exciting. In any case, here I was running off um, to India on a first-class trip sponsored by the government, which was an incredible way to see India. Uh, you know, we met the Prime Minister in Delhi, uh, got introduced to the Buddhist uh, history in Ellora and the Ajanta Caves, which was incredible. I didn't really know what was going on, but because we were moving fast and India is pretty crazy. 
but I just photographed and snap, snap, snapped, and maybe this year I'll get into some of those boxes. Uh, I was lucky to go to Bodh Gaya and Sarnath and uh, meditate under the Bodhi tree, not really understanding, but you know, having an idea. Uh, there's also Kajuraho, the sex erotic temples. That was a different way of spirituality. Was uh, the Taj Mahal, such an expression of love? Uh, we were in Pune for this uh, Filipino Indian wedding, and actually Rajneesh had a little. Uh, his ashram was just like two blocks away, so I would go explore there and see that type of. Uh, it was uh, crazy with Rajneesh. Uh, Varanasi was quite amazing, you know, to be there and to be on the ghats and see the cremations. And it was pretty mind-boggling, as India is, uh, those of you that have been there. But again, little did I know that after seeing the cremations that was so striking that um, I would, we would be scattering Harvey Milk's ashes in the San Francisco Bay just in a few months. Uh, we're lucky to go to Calcutta, and again, this is like every day, it's like the stimulation and absorbing it, I don't know. Uh, you know, and one day I went to the Jewish synagogue, saw them practicing as hundreds of thousands of years, went to a Kali temple where people are sacrificing and blood is all over the, the place, Imperial Gardens and the train station where uh, thousands of people living on the streets, that was a preview of Ronald Reagan's governorship when he closed the mental hospitals and cut things. Uh, also, I was so lucky to spend a little time at Mother Teresa's uh, home for the dying and orphanage. And again, the horrible suffering, but the joy and the beauty in these nuns' faces that were taking care of these people. And again, I think I look back that that gave me some strength or something to be able to come back to San Francisco to the AIDS epidemic. Love and compassion. Uh, I came back from that trip, had all 150, 160 rolls of Kodachrome uh, processed at Harvey Milk's camera store, and uh, we talked about it. I talked about it with him. He saw lots of them, and then you know, within a month, he he was uh, uh, assassinated and the mayor, Moscone, and we scattered his ashes. It was a very difficult time uh, for all of us here in the city. I was quite in depression, I guess you could call it, still worked. And then uh, my cousin took me to, in 1979, to a total solar eclipse that was happening in the Columbia River. And this is when the sun and the moon line up in the middle of the day, it's dark and flowers close up and animals run off. It's quite amazing. And, you know, it was raining, but right at the uh, totality, the clouds separated and we were able to see it. And that just gave me a spark of energy, and I just decided I had to uh, take a journey and I wasn't going to keep in the slump. And I applied for a sabbatical for a year. I bought a year Pan Am around the world ticket. And I knew I could go to India on my own. I didn't need the first class. I could do it as a ordinary person, and I knew there was another eclipse in India that February, and I hit the road. Uh, the Philippines, All Souls Day, it's the first time I saw people having picnics at the cemetery. I mean, I just couldn't get over that, but that was a real wonderful thing. People drinking and smoking weed and picnicking and taking pictures with their dead relatives. It was quite striking. In the Thailand, I was lucky to meet a guy that took me into the Golden Triangle, and we went trekking and stayed at Buddhist monasteries. I didn't like talk to the guys or study, but I just sort of was there. And Nepal, you know, showed up on the king's birthday, and the mix of Buddhism and Hinduism in Nepal was fascinating. Met a lot of Tibetans. Didn't really speak, but somehow related to them. Uh, in Sri Lanka. I ended up at, uh, in Kandy on Buddha's birthday at the Temple of the Tooth of elephants and all this going on. So I was really, really lucky in Java and Borobudur to be at uh, the biggest Buddhist temple. It was quite a, it was quite a, quite a, quite a year. And uh, people would say, well, who's your teacher? You went to India to 
who, where did that I, you know, for me it was just being on the road and meeting people and talking to rickshaw drivers and beggars and, you know, one minute you're looking at a leper marching band in Jaipur and then you turn around and there's the most beautiful woman and the most beautiful sari. And this is, I guess, what life is all about. I came back, taught some more. Before I knew it, I got a, a trip to Japan to be the ambassador. I mean, I just, just couldn't believe how my life was going after such depression. And that was like Disneyland. Everything was clean after India. Everything was clean and efficient, and there was no burglars. There was no pickpockets. There were no beggars. It was just wonderful, and people took me, and I just had such a, a wonderful experience uh, for four months. And I came back to San Francisco just thinking, what a life I've had. I sat at my apartment looking over the city and the bay, and I said, you know, I could die today, and um, I would have a good life. And then about two weeks later, the article started coming up about a gay cancer was hitting gay men in New York, San Francisco, and L.A., and I was like, whoa. <laughs> and uh, I did want to live some more, and uh, luckily I'm still here today. I guess during, like you were talking, the 80s was a very difficult time in San Francisco, but how we developed community and all these organizations of, to help each other, and with all this uh, suffering, we just had so much joy. I, I met Isan Dorsey, not in meditation, and not at the Hartford Set Center, but I would see him at Cliff's Hardware Store on Castro, and the joy and the, the, the love that he, sh he shared and all the people that did all so many things from the, the hospices to pause and so forth, and meeting Charles Garfield and Shanti and Stephen Levine, Ram Das, all were, really, were, this is such a magic place, San Francisco. Uh, in the 90s, though, even though so many people were passing away and the suffering was continuing, even though we were doing such wonderful work, it was very hard for me. I got an opportunity to go to Los Angeles the Los Angeles Gay and Lesbian Center was taking over aid services. The county of LA gave them the money. They said, we don't want to do it. You guys know how to do it. You take care of it. So I was so lucky to go and start a new life down there and help them set up this uh, clinic that had Western medicine and Eastern medicine. We had the doctors and, well, there was no medicine in those days, <laughs> really. Uh, but we had an acupuncture clinic, we had massage, we had Tai Chi, we had Qigong, we had meditation. So we had all these things for all the clients. I was so fortunate that I was able to meet with all these people one-on-one -on -one in a private room and hear their story, listen to them. And I think, you know, I hope to do some service. And uh, I, But I really learned so much from all these conversations and all these people and all the strength of these people going through so much pain and suffering. Uh, in those days in L.A. too, it was wonderful. The Dalai Lama came several times, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, Pima Chodron, Ram Das and Krishna Das always were coming through. There was yoga teachers, these straight women that would give free yoga classes to people with AIDS every week, twice a week, and they're still doing it in L.A. 27 years later. I think, so my practice was trying to hang around bodhisattvas and trying to... Uh, uh, learn from them and hopefully to share myself. Uh, I've been very fortunate uh, after the medicine came through I was very felt okay I guess it's time the epidemics changed I gotta take a break leave it to the younger folks and I did some more traveling and I uh, ended up in Vietnam and uh, Thailand and uh, came back, decided it was time to come back to San Francisco, even though I've been coming back four times a year to visit friends. But I made my day when I arrived was the Castro Street Fair mm -hmm. for my official day back and walking through there. And there was like four tables with gay Buddhist groups. And it was like, what's going on here? And uh, how wonderful. So I came and visited them. And it's been a really, really wonderful uh, time since I've been back uh, full time. And uh, the Sangha has been really important, and now maybe I have time to study sutras and read more and have more developed practice. But I guess it's all the path, <coughs> and it was my path. And again, we have wonderful teachers that you guys have been inviting over the years that I've learned from, but basically 
it's all of you too that we learn from and we support. So thank you so much. We do have some time for a few questions and comments if you guys are, are open to that. Will you take questions and comments? Anyone, has, anyone have any? Uh, I'll do my um, traditional uh, cheerleading for the dark duo. I, um, to, to find out that I'm sitting in a room with such wonderful people, and to have the two of you be able to share your experiences and your depth and your caring is just fantastic to me. I mean, it, it's, it's very different to sit in a room and be kind of an audience and listen, but to know the Sangha, to, to learn more about each other and how um, you know, deep everybody is, it's just fantastic. So I thank you both very much for doing this, and I thank the group for having this feature. I, I've been looking forward to hear everybody. Yeah, um, actually, the day I arrived in Los Angeles for this new job, in the LA Times, the front page was that a white minister from West Hollywood Presbyterian Church, a Jewish lesbian rabbi from the gay synagogue, and Carl Bean, the African-American Christian leader, were arrested to get 5P21. And I went, oh boy, so I thought San Francisco was in the forefront. Things are happening. Uh, actually, f for me, we were at the center. We had people coming in from everywhere. Carl Bean was doing incredible work at that, uh, at that center as both a spiritual church as well as doing aid services. And we had uh, a lot of you know, LA is a very diverse city, like all, but we had so many different groups. There was uh, services, medical, hopefully, that we could help with at the center, but uh, different uh, ethnic groups set up their own support groups. There was uh, acupuncture that was going on in the black community. There was spiritual groups going on. Uh, my friend Michael Morgan was... Uh, studying acupuncture and he actually set up, I forgot what the name of it was, but there was several organizations. Um, and I think people were working together for a long time. And again, the incredible dedication and the spiritual path of Christians, Catholics, Buddhists, uh, Hindus, uh, Asian Americans, we had Asian support groups for people that were positive. There were people that would come into my office from Thailand who had no idea about anything and luckily we could direct them to support groups. The same thing with African Americans that maybe would be coming from South LA, were afraid to go anywhere in their community. Hopefully we directed to them. Actually it was a really wonderful time for people working together. Um, you know, there were some problems of course and some things but 
Uh, I think it was a wonderful, incredible time in Los Angeles for, for that. I, I, don't know, I know in San Francisco there's a black coalition on AIDS and so forth. Um, I'm not sure if that's, but there was incredible work being done. We had um, uh, so many different specific support groups as well as integrated support groups, meaning different cultures, different ethnics, ethnicities. But Carl Bean did incredible work in those years, incredible work. And so many others, Reggie Williams here, uh, Bobby Smith in Los Angeles, incredible men. And this is just your everyday guys, the guys that live next door to you, the guys that were just your regular guys that turned into incredible bodhisattvas, just doing incredible work with love and compassion. I, I agree, although um, I don't think that the African American community had the kind of community support that the white gay community did in the, in the 80s and the 90s. There was a lot more denial. AIDS was a bigger taboo. Being gay was a bigger taboo in the community. Um, I think that a lot of things, the community stuff, came later for African Americans, and that always kind of broke my heart. Yeah, uh, I was wondering if either of your two long-term partners were practicing daily or Buddhist, and what impact did that have on your relationships? Are you being a Buddhist on your relationships? Uh, no, and that's a really interesting issue that, that I explore. Um, my, my last partner uh, was very respectful of my practice and actually um, let me take him to a couple of kind of beginning Buddhism classes. And, but he, he was a little um, uh, ADD, so it, it was really tough for him. <laughs> uh, but he was respectful of me and... Um, we had a wonderful relationship despite that, and I've never been in a relationship with another practicing Buddhist, and I'm not sure whether that would be a better thing or a not better thing. I don't, I don't know. I, can't put it, I think about it. We, we, still have, we should move. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I just want to share this. Uh, again, with me, it's meeting with remarkable men. Uh, it's interesting, I had a relationship with a Japanese man who, of course, comes from a Buddhist uh, family in Japan and is totally secular, to po but I think has the Buddhist ethics. So, you know, he thinks what I'm doing, or in those days, was sort of odd, but I think the Buddhist ethics was there even though it wasn't the practice. Uh, another friend of mine was not a Buddhist, but an, a, a spiritual person who did, uh, who was, had a Native American and uh, also African background, so, and spiritual, but we did yoga together, we did um, eating healthy together, we, you know, stayed away from drugs and alcohol and doing work, service, so I think that spirituality for me makes more important than if a person is, you know, and my other friends that I worked with were Tibetan, you know, and they take me to their place and but I just couldn't do all those prostrations and bad back and you know and then go to the Zen Center you know so I, but uh, I think it's important just to be around people or partners who have a spiritual core regardless of what the specific thing is to me that's much more important to connect people do we have a host today um, a host today uh, brought some apples and cookies um, if you have, is everyone here all the members we came to members today? Anyone hasn't been here before? Yeah, we have a couple of two. Oh, okay, okay, so there's a, there's a donut bowl, uh, which is for donations. If uh, you can leave a donation of $5, $8, that would be appreciated. Um, that's not uh, mandatory. And uh, I'm not going to wear on the donut bowl today. I'm not feeling well, so I'm just going to leave it on the table if you don't mind. And if you use, uh, there's tea and cookies and snacks. If you use a teacup, please wash it out and set it up on the rack to dry. And around 1230, people will gather at the front door and we'll go for lunch later. Announcements? Yes, hi. Uh, our speaker next week is Eugene Cash. 
He is the founding teacher of the San Francisco Insight Meditation Community of San Francisco that I meet on Sunday nights. And he's a teacher at Spirit Rock. And also, I am your speaker, course speaker coordinator for June, July, August, and September. And I am looking for people for Dharma duos. So if you'd like to do it, there's never a good time to do it. So, you know, I got asked, I've done it, and it was a remarkable experience because you just kind of come and, it was interesting to just talk about my history and what was going on with me and how I got here. So, and there's no great stories and there's no bad stories. There's just stories. It's just about your experience. So if you'd like to do that, or if I come tap you on the shoulder, you can say no, but I'm going to get you some way. <laughs> Any other any other announcements? Okay, David's gonna lead us in the closing. May all beings everywhere plagued with sufferings of body and mind quickly be freed from their illnesses. May those frightened cease to be afraid. May those bound be free. May the powerless find power and may people think of befriending one another. May those who find themselves in trackless, fearful, fearful wilderness, the children, the aged, the unprotected, be guarded by beneficent celestials and may they swiftly attain Buddhahood. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.